Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us, only sky. Imagine all the
Today we have two scripture readings, one from the Quran and one from Luke in the New Testament. Hear what God's Spirit is saying to you, a reading from the Quran scripture, Surah 3, 45 to 51. The angel said, O Mary, God gives you good news of a word from him. His name is the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, well esteemed in this world and the next, and one of the nearest. He will speak to the people from the crib and in adulthood and will be one of the righteous. She said, My Lord, how can I have a child when no man has touched me? He said, It will be so. God creates whatever he wills. To have anything done, he only says it, be, and it is. And he will teach him the scripture and wisdom and the Torah and the gospel. A messenger to the children of Israel, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. I make for you out of clay the figure of a bird. Then I breathe into it, and it becomes a bird by God's leave. And I heal the blind and the leprous, and I revive the dead by God's leave. And I inform you concerning what you eat and, I, and what you store in your homes. In that is a sign for you if you are believers. And verifying what lies before me of the Torah and to make lawful for you some of what was forbidden to you. I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, so fear God and obey me. God is my Lord and your Lord, so worship him. That is a straight path. And from Luke 1, 26 to 38. From the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the Son of the Lord, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And then the angel departed from here. Here ends the reading of words that give us insight on God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Friends, will you pray with me? God of us all, we ask that we might look around and see you in the faith of others. And today we give particular thanks for those who also look back to Abraham, Jewish and Muslim siblings 
who are, in fact, siblings of faith. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be pleasing to you and acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today we're continuing our series on holy envy, finding beauty and, in fact, God in the faith of others. And, of course, today are talking about Islam. When I was in seminary, one of my favorite classes was the course on Christian-Muslim dialogue. It was taught by the late world-renowned scholar Dr. Laman Sana. Dr. Sana had been born in Gambia, West Africa, to a poor Muslim family. His family was of a royal bloodline, actually, but they lived in desperate poverty. He grew up surrounded by Muslim friends and neighbors, but when he was in his teens, he recognized that he was consumed with questions of faith. And he met some missionaries and converted from Islam to Christianity. I think to everyone's surprise, including his own. He then traveled to the United States and he did his undergraduate degree in history, and then he went to the United Kingdom and got his advanced degrees in Islamic history. So he ended up with a foot in both worlds, so to speak. He was born into a Muslim family, his PhD was in Islamic history, and yet his confessional religion was Roman Catholicism. He spent his entire career trying to build bridges between Christians and Muslims, trying especially to help Christians understand that Islam is really a religion of peace. It was an uphill battle many times. But I deeply appreciated hearing his unique perspective and being able to begin class by reading the poetry of Rumi, which we heard a poem of earlier today as we sung, preparing for communion. The poetry of Rumi contrasted with the Psalms. It was beautiful. Religion is something that can, of course, be used for great good or for great evil. But Islam is, at its core, a religion of peace. In fact, the word Islam means submission. Submission to God. And so it is every Muslim's job to submit to God's peace. And the Muslim understanding is that that act of submission to God's will is an act of peace for Muslims. In fact, wherever I have been, Muslims have often been my best colleagues. And here that is certainly the case. Imam Taha Hassan at the Islamic Center of San Diego is one of the best colleagues that I've ever had the privilege of working with. He seems to be everywhere, always involved in justice work, and I have no idea how he does it. The man exhausts me just by seeing his schedule. Muslims are people of peace, and Islam is a religion of peace, but unfortunately we live in a post-9-11 world where there is often, even all these years later, harmful stereotypes about what Muslims do and believe. And as Christians, who strive to be open-minded, I think one of our core obligations is to strive to learn about and to help others know this, this beautiful religion, religious tradition. So Islam is one of the Abrahamic traditions. Do you know what that means, an Abrahamic tradition? So Abrahamic traditions are the traditions that look back to Abraham as the founder. So Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all Abrahamic traditions. Now Jews and Christians tend to look back to Abraham and trace our roots through his son Isaac, but Muslims look back to Abraham and trace their roots through his son Ishmael. Do you remember that convoluted family tree? Do you remember the story in Genesis? Abraham and Sarah are getting on in years and can't have children, and so Sarah gives Abraham her handmaid, her concubine, Hagar, and they conceive a child, and she bears a child named Ishmael. But then, through a miracle, 
Sarah becomes pregnant. She laughs at the idea. Remember that? And then she conceives and she bears a son named Isaac. And once Isaac is born, Sarah doesn't have much use for Hagar or Ishmael. And so she asks Abraham to dismiss them. And he does. They're gone. In the Quran, we find out a bit more about what's said to have happened. That she's dismissed with this child into the desert, and there's no water. And she goes back and forth looking for water. And then through a miracle from God, water springs forth, and they are able to survive. The legend goes then that Abraham eventually makes contact with them again. And Abraham and his son Ishmael build the Kaaba, the big cube. And Gabriel, the angel, brings a holy rock, which is placed in the center of the cube. So the Kaaba is what Muslims go and visit on their pilgrimage to Mecca. And that marks that miracle of water springing forth in the wilderness. You see, we have a common root here. We just trace it in different ways. And so you can probably tell from that story that there are some common characters in the Bible and the Quran. In fact, if you were to open the Quran and start reading, you would read about Adam and Noah and Ezekiel and Elijah and Elisha and King David and Solomon. And yes, even if you kept reading about Mary and Jesus. Did you know that Jesus is mentioned 157 times in the Quran? 157 times, which means that he is mentioned more than Muhammad, and in fact, more than anyone else in the Quran. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is the most mentioned person in the Quran. And as you heard from the scripture lessons that we heard just a moment ago, the way that Jesus is portrayed is actually pretty similar. We heard the story of the Annunciation, first in the Quran, and then in the Gospel of Luke. And even the things that Jesus is said to have done is pretty similar. In fact, the way that Muslims understand Jesus is as a great prophet who had a virgin birth, grew up, had followers, who performed many miracles, who confronted the religious and political status quo, and even that he was raised up to heaven. There are, of course, some important differences there. Uh, for instance, Muslims don't tend to believe that Jesus was crucified. Instead, they believe that he appeared to be crucified, but God intervened at the last moment and raised him up to heaven. And, of course, they take issue with the whole notion of Jesus being the Son of God. In fact, in the Quran, uh, that's specifically disputed. Both Jews and Muslims tend to take issue with the fact that Christians confess the Trinity most of the time. Uh, they view that as polytheism creeping into a monotheistic tradition. Right? So monotheism means you believe in one God, and polytheism means that you believe in multiple gods. And they look at this whole notion of the Trinity, the three-in-one, as a polytheistic tradition. And as you know, Christians sometimes have problems with the Trinity as well. I don't tend to be terribly Trinitarian myself, for instance. And so there is a conflict in how Jesus is seen, but Muslims do confess Jesus to be the Jewish Messiah. As you heard in the Quran reading just a few moments ago, uh, the Annunciation confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. So it's this interesting interweaving of how Jesus is seen. So what does that mean that Muhammad's role is? Well, I don't think we should say that Muhammad is the Muslim Jesus. That would be an incorrect assumption, although I have heard Christians say that. Instead, the Muslim understanding is that God has revealed truth over the course of history at various times. 
So God revealed truth to Moses, and God revealed truth to Jesus, and there was nothing wrong with that revelation. It's just that the followers of those people kind of messed it up a bit in their interpretation. And so Jesus is considered to be the penultimate prophet before Muhammad. Muhammad is considered to be the most revered prophet because from the Muslim perspective, he got it right. God revealed truth, and Muhammad wrote it down so that God's truth was unaltered. Now, it's important to say that scholars think that really uh, the Quran probably came into existence much like the Bible through oral tradition over time. But the understanding is that it is literally the, the Word of God. And in fact, that if it is translated outside of Arabic, it is an interpretation and not as valid as it is in Arabic. So anytime we read an English translation of the Quran, you'll notice that it says an interpretation because the only real valid version of the Quran is in Arabic. So it's interesting that Jesus is deeply respected, is seen as the Messiah, and yet there is a point of divergence here. In another life, uh, in another place, when I was leading the Interfaith Alliance group, our group would always meet with a prayer at the beginning of our meeting. And the thought was that if we boiled everything down to the lowest common denominator and used general terms for God and refrained from saying the name of Jesus, we would probably be okay, and everyone could find meaning in that space. So we would address God as something like the divine or great mystery, and we would always just end with amen without saying uh, in Jesus' name or anything like that. And one day we had got done with our prayer at the beginning of the meeting, and our Muslim representative said, why do we do this? And someone said, well, what do you mean? And she said, you know this isn't a valid prayer for us, right? And someone said, well, why not? Uh, we, we didn't say anything specifically Christian or anything specifically of one religious tradition. And she said, yeah, but if a Christian is saying the prayer and your concept is that Jesus is God, then that's not a valid prayer for me because I don't confess that. And then all the progressive Christians in the room said, no, 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 that's not necessarily what we believe when we say God. And then other Christians in the room said, of course it is. Of course that's what we mean. And so she said, okay, well, setting that aside, you know that prayer means something very specific for Muslims, right? Well, there's a ritual cleansing, and we face towards Mecca, and we prostrate ourselves, and that is what's valid prayer for us. So while this is nice, it's not a prayer. And the Christians in the room were dumbfounded, of course. People who thought they were being progressive and thought they were trying to include everyone realized that, no, actually, we were promoting our own theology and, and making everyone kind of ascribe to that. And so for the next several months, different religious traditions would talk about how they understood prayer at the beginning of each meeting instead of having that time of prayer. And instead of going towards the least common denominator, we were able to embrace the richness of all those traditions and learn from each other. And it was beautiful. Prayer is, of course, extremely important in Islam and is one of the five core things that a Muslim must do. In Islam, there are five pillars of faith. Have you heard of this? So religion scholars call Islam a religion of orthopraxy. That means correct practice. And they consider Christianity to be a religion of orthodoxy which means correct belief. So in a religion of orthopraxy, you have to do certain things to be a part of that religious tradition. So in Islam, prayer is one of those things. Another is making a profession of faith. So saying there is no God but Allah, and Allah is simply the Arabic word for God. So there's no God but God, and 
Muhammad is his messenger, which sounds pretty similar to what we ask people to do when they're making a confession of faith. Do you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and will you strive to follow him in word and deed? So making a profession of faith, almsgiving is another pillar of Islamic faith, as Steve reminded us during the offering. And Muslims are required to give 2.5% of their accumulated wealth. Now notice I didn't say of their income or of their income after taxes. 2.5% of their total wealth. Charity, making the world a better place, is one of the core tenets of the faith. Another is fasting during the month of Ramadan, during the day. There are exceptions to this, of course, uh, because of age or pregnancy or things like that. But at the end of the day, there's always a breaking of the fast. And one of my favorite things to do here in San Diego is that the Islamic Center always has a great feast where they invite all of their interfaith colleagues to, to come to a restaurant and to break the fast together. And that's always such a beautiful part of the day. And then the, the last one is to make a pilgrimage, the Hajj, to Mecca at least once in your life, if at all possible, if you're a Muslim. So if you do those five things, then you are a Muslim. That's what it takes to be a Muslim. Islam is the second largest religion in the world, second only to Christianity, and there are two main branches of Islam, Sunni, Muslims and Shia Muslims, and the vast majority of Muslims, 75 to 90%, are Sunni Muslims. And the way that those branches got separated is that they had a disagreement about who was to take over for Muhammad after he died. But the important thing to know today is that there is no central leader of Islam, there's no pope of Islam. There's not even a general minister and president of Islam, which makes it hard to take a concrete stand as a religion on anything. Imams, in fact, are prayer leaders. So the organization is different within Islam. I think that one of the most important things for us to walk away with today is, is two concepts here. One, that Islam is ultimately a religion of peace. And two, that Muslims are our siblings in the Abrahamic tradition and that we ought to appreciate them. So if you don't know how to build a relationship with Muslims or you have more questions and you want to delve deeper into this, I've got a way that you can start Join us this Thursday at noon and meet my friend Imam Taha Hassan, who will be talking to us at the Islamic Center of San Diego, and observe the way that Muslims pray at midday. Today we give deep and abiding thanks for Islam and for our siblings of the Muslim faith. Thanks be to God. Amen.